In case you didn't stay up late enough to watch it last month. And the Grammy goes to. This is how Lenny Kravitz presented the Grammy for Album of the Year. We are John Baptiste. Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. And I'm so happy to be sharing this episode with you today. When pianist, composer, band leader, late night television personality, and ambassador of radical positivity John Batiste emerged at the end of the 2022 Grammys with five awards, including Album of the Year, some people were surprised. Maybe none more than John himself. But if you've been paying attention to his astronomical trajectory, there was something inevitable about it. It was not only an award for an album, but the recognition of an artist with a singular career, one who's managed to bridge the gap that so few are able to do. When he gathered his composure, this is what he said. I believe this to my core. There is no best musician, best artist, best dancer, best actor. The creative arts are subjective, and they reach people at a point in their lives when they need it most. It's like a song or an album is made and it almost has a a radar to find the person when they need it the most. I mean, man, I like to thank God. I, I just put my head down and I work on the craft every day. I love music. I've been playing since I was a little boy. I, I, it's more than entertainment for me. It's a spiritual practice. And um, there's so many people that went into making this album. My grandfather's on the album. My nephews, my dad. Back before he was the star that he is today, before he was an Oscar-winning composer, before he was on national TV every night as the band leader on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, before he was among the rare jazz artists in history whose name is known to the general public, he was a young, rising star of the piano, making what he called social music. John Batiste was born in Kenner, Louisiana, a suburb of New Orleans, into a musical family, and he was thrust into the mix at an early age, singing and playing drums. At around 11, he switched from the drums to the piano, and he never looked back. Eventually, John moved to New York to go to Juilliard. But while he was still in New Orleans, he studied and played with Alvin Batiste, who he says taught him to be you, even if it's the most obtuse thing. And that original lesson has guided him through his life and his career. Before he left the stage with that Album of the Year Grammy in his hand earlier this year, he said exactly that. Be you. That's it. From pretty much the moment he arrived in New York, John's ascent seemed to be just a matter of time. There was something about him, his energy, his personality, his way that was just electrifying. Of course, none of it would mean anything without the music. And he was just a fountain of music. While he was still in school, John started to work as a sideman for artists including Abby Lincoln, Roy Hargrove, Cassandra Wilson, and Wynton Marsalis. He learned about leadership and collaboration from all of them. And it's in this place of artistic awakening in his 20s when he begins to assert himself fully to explore what he wants to do, what he wants to make. It's here where we find him in today's episode. So I would like to invite you, if you will, to imagine a time before COVID, before the turbulence of these last years. Barack Obama is still the president, and John Baptiste is in my house. It's a Sunday afternoon. John rolls in, sits down at my Wurlitzer, and he just goes in. And then we start to talk. Can you picture it? Okay, now hold that thought. Because I told you all that so I could tell you this. Today's episode marks the beginning of a new partnership between the Third Story Podcast and listener-supported WBGO Studios. Every week during the month of May, we'll be revisiting another episode from the archive. And then starting in June, you'll find a new episode every other week. Head to wbgo.org slash studios to find these episodes and hit the links to subscribe on the podcast platform of your choosing. If you're just getting to know the podcast, this is a great way to check out some of my favorite episodes. But if you've been with me the whole time, I love you and you know it. And you'll still be able to listen in the same way you always have. And the show will not change for you in any way. Today's conversation with John Batiste happened in the first months of the podcast back in 2014. In the original introduction, I said, This interview was somehow very transformative for me personally. I like John Batiste so much. The way he plays, the way he carries himself, his sense of personal style and overall 
attitude and conception. He's still in his 20s, but he's so aware of the tradition and his place within it, and so optimistic about the power of music in the world. I just can't stop thinking about our conversation. You know, there are those moments when you feel fortunate to be alive right now, at this time in history, in this place. And talking to John Batiste made me feel that way. Listening back to the conversation eight years later, I'm struck by how much of what John told me back then has continued to inform him on his journey, like his commitment to social music, self-expression, freedom, and independence. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. It's at Third Story Pod on all three, or visit third-story.com to see the full archive. Here's me and John Batiste talking it down back in the day. WBGO Studios, Third Story Podcast. Jay Bat, let's do this. John Batiste, man, thank you so much for coming out here and joining me today. Man, thank you for having me. Thank you for getting me this wonderful tea that I'm consuming at the moment and letting me play on the whirly and the roads and everything, man. This is great already. I love watching you come in the room and, and kind of light up when you see the instruments, almost like you have no choice in the matter. You just have to sit down and start to play. It makes me wonder if that's kind of how you were coming up as well when it came to music. You know, when I was younger, I was in Kenner, Louisiana, in a suburb outside of New Orleans. And uh, my family is the Baptiste family of Louisiana. There's a big musical lineage. Musical families are a very big part of the culture. And I had this dichotomy, if you will, of living in Kenner in the suburbs and doing regular kid stuff like basketball, playing chess, uh, riding bikes, and going around the neighborhood doing stuff. A lot of times that you're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Just having a good time. Yeah. Man. Then at night, going into the city with my dad, my uncles, my cousins, all musicians, and seeing the scene. And I always had a love for music, but it steadily grew as I got older. And it was very interesting how it kind of started from being in my family and being around me to kind of taking over. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting process. Did that process happen when you were still playing drums or was, did it happen when you found the piano? It happened when I went to the piano. I've heard you talk about how your mother suggested that you make the change from drums to piano. And just that story alone kind of opens up a whole world of questions for me. You know, the first one has to do, I guess, with your mother's role in the family, because it seems to suggest to me that she really had her eyes on the whole picture and sort of understood the world of music and, and also maybe where you would fit in in that way. You know, your parents, they know you in a way that's so intimate because they've seen the beginning from the very beginning. So... I think more than anything, there's an intuitive connection with something that is, it comes from you. Like if you were to have a kid, that's actually a part of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there was a beautiful intuitive vibration that she, I think, felt from the time that I started playing the piano that was telling her, I guess, you know, this is the right move for you. I think you should move in that direction. I feel something about that. Maybe she didn't see the whole picture, but it was more it was more ordained mm -hmm. than anything. Like the piano. Yeah. <laughs> no, not these drums. Get on that piano. <laughs> and before you found the piano and you were playing drums, I understand that was before music sort of consumed you, but how did that come to pass that you became a you were playing drums? It's kind of like folk music, family band everybody's playing and you're up there and you're a kid and they're like, here. Hit this. Hit on this. Play. Go. Solo. And you'll be in front of a crowd of people. And for me, that never was how I thought I would end up as a professional musician or anything like that. I guess it was really for me, I didn't think about professional music at all. It's kind of like, okay. Yeah, Dad says hit the drums, so here I go. Did anybody show you anything? Vicariously you learn, but not direct instruction or someone saying you should really study these recordings or you should mm -hmm. 
<laughs> listen to this guy and hear how he approaches accompaniment. Mm -hmm. It was more like, you see, the people out there, we doing a show. So when it's your turn, I want you to give it all you got. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, though, that was the best place you could have come from because then as you approach more and more sophisticated music, you always had that that kind of lit the the path for you, right? Understanding that whatever you play, you know, you have to bring everything you have and try to turn people on with it. Yes. I think that it's a transition from this kind of communal folk element in music where they would play the New Orleans cultural music, their own music, they would write funk and R&B music, which is what they grew up with. This is the Baptiste band. Yeah. And, um, I learned all of those traditional songs from New Orleans and all the stuff they played and stuff like that. And then I would perform in front of people in the community and on stage. And then I would transition into this more high art world later, where it's like studying jazz and classical music and the intense vibration of Juilliard and all, all of the conservatory atmosphere. And then I think putting those two together and now coming into the commerce side of things which is popular music and making those three things collide art the high art world uh folk music and that upbringing and popular music mm -hmm. it's kind of where i'm i'm at now yeah well let's talk about how you got there you made the switch to piano how old were you i was 11 11 years old i switched to piano and that was about the time that I also started studying. And so what did that entail? It was a classical piano lesson every Sunday. It was like um, one of those things where there was a private teacher named Miss Clara. <laughs> who uh, She taught piano lessons on an upright piano in her house, in her living room. Mm -hmm. And she was also the piano player in the church. So they were like can you teach John the piano? He's starting to play. And I would study classical piano lessons with Miss Clara every Sunday. And then I had a, a band with my cousins. who They were older than me. Um, they, they, at the time, were both drummers. And I was also just starting to play piano. And uh, they were super talented. So one of my cousins decides, well, if we're going to start a band, I should learn something else. So he learns the bass. Yeah. And he's playing the bass. I'm playing piano. And my other cousin is playing drums, and that was the band. So mm -hmm. I was learning music, writing music with them very early, and so, we'd learn video game music and play in that band. Mm -hmm. Super Mario? Even later, like um, Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Street Fighter Alpha. You remember how uh, there was a series Street Fighter 2 and then Capcom kept putting it out until PlayStation came out and then it turned to Street Fighter Alpha. Mm -hmm. And we really loved the music from Street Fighter Alpha and Sonic the Hedgehog because that was when Sega Genesis had just come out. So that's what you were digging. That's the music you, it was really hitting you. We were really moved more than anything in that band by video game music. And Sonic the Hedgehog and Street Fighter were the two top choices. That must have taken 60% of our repertoire or more was video game music. And would you transcribe it? We would transcribe it note for note. So like a lot of people talk about coming to music through transcription, you did too. It's just the music that you were transcribing was a little bit unusual. Oh, yeah. I'm even thinking back to um, our favorite game was Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> and we played the music from that it's kind of inspiration. We never played those songs on live shows for some reason. It was only the Street Fighter music <laughs> live. But uh, that was how I came into it, f through the classical and through the video games. Mm -hmm. Were you singing in that band? No, not at all. I sung with my family's band because I was the youngest at that time. And since the time I was eight or nine, they would have me come up and sing as kind of the uh, the young Michael Jackson lineage, you know, they came from that era. Yeah, right. So it was a it was a thing. That was what I did. I would sing the song and be like the kid that they featured, mm -hmm. the family. But in the band with my cousins, it was all music. Everything was instrumental. Did you start to bring in some some other music as well? If it wasn't video game music, what else were you playing? Most of it was that, and the other music that we brought in was like 
songs that my uncle would write. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of songs that we would write for special occasions. Our our yearly appearance at the Children's Museum being one of them. You know, we we played. Uh, what's the song called? I'm trying to remember. Kids. Hmm. Yeah, it's like we're kids. We want to have fun. <laughs> Just kids, come on and join us. And then <laughs> we sung that, and we play. Um, Welcome to the Children's Museum, a song that he wrote for the museum. Mm-hmm. We would play Oh, When the Saints Go Marching In, New Orleans traditional music like that every now and then, but not really. It was more of a funk soul band. And um, and you in high school yet? Or is this no, still before, no. before high school? Yeah, before high school. Like I was still like 11 and 12. And even younger when I was playing the drums. And, you know, I didn't play piano then. I was a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. It was no piano. I didn't own a piano in um, my house until I was in high school, like Mm -hmm. 11th grade or something like that. So uh, how do you draw the distinction between being a keyboard player and a piano? What's the difference? It's it's extremely different. Keyboard is, is another instrument to me. It's like, to me, the keyboard is not meant to be played like a piano because the sound that you get from a keyboard cuts at a different frequency. Mm -hmm. And it has so many different variables in terms of touch and in terms of not only the the frequency of the sound, but the choice of sounds. That changes the frequency. But just being electric, it makes it sit in the music in a really different way. Mm -hmm. It's not a percussion instrument. That's the main underlying character of it that I find different. Mm-hmm. keyboard isn't percussion whereas the piano by the nature of the hammers hitting the strings it resonates in the air differently and it affects the band differently it makes me wonder if actually later on when you sort of discovered the melodica maybe part of what allowed you to have a deeper understanding of the fact that it's a real instrument a lot of people don't think it's a real serious instrument was that you kind of understood that it's not a piano and it's not supposed to be a piano and it has its own function yeah, that's a really insightful point, Leo, because that's exactly how I feel about the melodica and also how I feel when I think back on what did I do to incorporate the melodica? When I think back on that, it was about not looking at it like a piano. That was actually the first step before anything. Mm-hmm. It was, this is not a piano. <laughs> that's very insightful, man. You set up the distinction. These are different. They have keys, but they're not the same. You know, yeah. you can't think about them as the same. Right. I think <laughs> with a keyboard, it's harder because you can play a sort of, quote, piano sound on mm-hmm. a keyboard. Even the piano sound on the keyboard is not, to me, to be played in the same way you would play a piano. Mm-hmm. Because it's all about frequency, man. Where does it vibrate in the air? How does it hit you as a listener? Mm-hmm. And that sound of that electric piano, like sometimes you hear that in house music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That piano sound is perfect in that context. You don't want a real piano on that, for right. instance. That frequency that you want is that electric kind of. Smaller, sharper. Yeah, that sharp. It's another thing, man. I really enjoyed playing keyboards when I was a kid. And I, I would make music on the keyboards, like tracking I make a lot of beats. I do a lot of things where we would take the keyboard sounds and create our own library of sounds. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess um, for me, my earliest composition and um, arranging experience would be taking the keyboard and multi-tracking different parts Mm -hmm. and finding what I liked, what I wanted to change or add. I never really wrote it out. It was more about tracking it and hearing what it would sound like if a band really would have played it live. Yeah. So eventually, I know you went to this arts high school, this uh, great music uh, and art program in, in New Orleans. Yeah, that was an incredible experience because it was my first realization that there were other people out there who were trying to, push it as hard as I wanted to push it and were my age and were talented and inspiring to me because they were doing things that at the time I didn't know were possible 
You were still living in the suburbs also. Yeah, I was in the suburbs. I, my whole upbringing in Kenner was um, <laughs> completely separate than my New Orleans musical experiences and touring around later, which, you know, is, it blows your mind, you know. <laughs> Coming from Kenner, it's like, wow. <laughs> so I, I, when I went to NOCA, it was actually a continuation of the, the Louis Satchmo Armstrong summer jazz camp. So that was when I was about 14, when I really thought about music as a serious thing, and I'd been going to the camp. But the camp was the first place that I'd encountered these young people who later would go to NOCA, and you know, people like Trombone Shorty, um, Christian Scott, the trumpet player, um, Sullivan Fortner, an amazing piano player. We used to practice together for hours and hours at a time. And I would just be amazed at some of the stuff he could do. Um, you know, there's many, many great young mm -hmm. musicians I ran across. I've heard people talk about how the New Orleans community is really actually very supportive and inclusive scene. Was that your experience? <laughs> I think that the New Orleans music scene is super supportive. I think it's inclusive and at the same time, I think there's something specific about the scene that, for better or for worse, stops it from changing. Mm -hmm. You could say that, hey, man, the scene is stagnant. There's not any development. It's one thing, and that's it. Or you could say, this is the only place in the world where right. you can experience this. It's authentic, and it's real. And young people are coming up in it every generation and they're coming out with their own thing. And for me, the scene is what it is. And you take from the scene what value you can, and you move to somewhere else if you want. Mm -hmm. You take it to some other place if you want. And for me, that's what I did. Yeah, I think I learned a lot from it, and I think at a certain point, moving to New York was a decision both to study and also to experience new things. What were you into before you moved to New York? Where had you arrived musically? You know, what were you thinking about and listening to? So many things had happened up until that point. I feel like New Orleans for me, when you talk about being inclusive, was a grounds for experimentation and musical discovery. I would play salsa gigs bands from cuba would come into town i would end up playing with them somehow i played with my family of course which was like funk and r&b and soul music and just new orleans even zydeco and cajun music because my grandfather he was cajun and creole i would play all of these jazz gigs when i started to really get into jazz and then i would study with the great alvin baptiste mm -hmm. who opened my ears to my whole understanding in my ears for originality comes from his conception, playing with him and Donald Harrison. Mm. And what was that conception? What exactly was it that opened you up? Be you. Be you, even if it's the weirdest, most obtuse, out-of-the-box thing, do that rather than imitate something else. And it's not shunning what came before or shunning anything that you can learn from someone else, even if it's your peers. But it's at the end of the day, the underlying principle is to express yourself truly and authentically. You have to figure out something that you've never heard before. Mm -hmm. And that as a 15 year old, 16 finding that, and starting to search for that was the thing that really made everything that I'm doing now come into being. Everything makes sense because of that. Mm -hmm. So many people, when they become musicians, they find their instrument, and then they have to figure out what music they want to make with that instrument, and then they discover the context around the music. Mm -hmm. You actually saw the context first. Mm -hmm. And as you started playing piano, you already had ideas about the music that you could make with it. You got to learn how to play the instrument, already very familiar with the music that you might be able to make with it. It's fascinating, Leo, because I think my experience with music came from first seeing what it meant to be a musician mm -hmm. before picking up an instrument. I lived in the house with one, and I saw the reality of what that is. 
nine times out of ten, if you don't come from a musical family, you don't really know the pros and cons of deciding yeah, right. to be a professional musician. So I saw that. And then I also saw from all of the different perspectives around me, my uncles, my cousins who were much older than me, and then my cousins who were close to my age, all of the different versions of that decision. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then that coupled with the ideas that started to grow before I found my main instrument, just from being around my cousins when we were putting music together and being around all of that energy in New Orleans, I had an idea of what music could be before I even could play the piano. So that to me is actually one of the main things that when I started to play piano, a lot of people think that, oh, you must have been like a, a prodigy to start yeah. so late. It really wasn't that. It was more that I had more of a fully formed musical concept before I had an instrument. Yeah, I hear that. You know, our mutual friend Michael Thurber and I talked about the idea yeah. that in your generation, we're about 10 years apart, a big part of the contribution, I think a lot of players in their 20s and freedom that you guys feel is to mix it up and to throw in like different spices like cooking whatever you grew up with and you liked it's all valid it's not like this is the jazz music and this is the r&b music and this is the pop music i make it's like no it's all the same i can make it all in the same way and that a big part of the contribution seems to be in allowing yourself to you say be you that means be all of you right everything whatever you dig that goes in the pot Mm -hmm. and it's not so separated so that that sound that you hear might come from the notes you play and the way you phrase but it also might come from the tunes that you choose and the way you choose to to arrange or put the band together that's mm -hmm. my my perception of it i think that a lot of the musical dogma if you will <laughs> yep. didn't infiltrate my development and i didn't even become aware of it until I was in my late teens. And you didn't become aware of the musical dogma until you were already in your late teens. Yeah. It which to me was a huge blessing. Like my family's band, they didn't really think about what they were playing or what they called it at all, ever. My cousins, we didn't think about that. I got with Alvin Batiste and all of the different musicians who I played with around New Orleans who Maybe they thought of it like that, but for me, it was me going into different situations every night and, and figuring out all of this music. And then, you know, my peers, we grew up with this wide variety of music and access that only kept growing as the years went on. You know, Trombone Shorty and I, um, Troy, we had a band together when we were 14 that um, we 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 actually kept playing together until I graduated high school and that band continued on and that's what he's doing now. Mm -hmm. But his whole concept and all of my other peers was um, coming from the same mentality from the teachers that we had from Alvin Baptiste, Clyde Kerr, Kid Jordan, Ellis Marsalis a little bit but not as much. Just all of those guys taught us, you know, just do your thing. When I got into this musical dogma of you have to do this, you have to be this, you have to figure that out. It was confusing, but at the same time, I had this really strong root. So hmm. I sorted that out with, um, <laughs> it was a lot of tumult, but mm -hmm. I was very, very fortunate because a lot of people, I think, start in music like that. With the dogma. Yeah. And then they have to figure out Later on. Out later, I mean, trust me, that there's a lot that can be learned from both, but at the end of the day, I'd rather be on this side of the fence. Yeah. So I get the feeling that you're kind of referring to what happened when you moved to New York. Is that what's happening here? Because eventually you came to New York and you went to Juilliard. Yeah. You know, there was a lot that happened when I moved to New York. I'm 17. I come from Kenner. I haven't really toured too many places around the world. My first European tour was the summer before I went to New York. i have been to New York maybe once before. And what was that tour? Uh, that tour was me and a jazz trio 
going to a small school in Spain <laughs> to play and then do like a master class. And yeah. Mark Carey was the guy who uh, led the trio. He's a great pianist. He lives in Harlem. It's amazing. He was one of the first people who really kind of looked out for me, like super cool and an understanding of the fact that I, I wanted to do something different. He was in that same boat, kind of a kindred spirit. Really awesome guy too, like super cool to hang out with. And, and he exposed me to the New York scene mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Uh, going up to his house at midnight when I first moved here and we played a piano until like 6 a.m. Wow. You know, like that kind of a thing for me was golden when I first moved here. So there were guys like him, but for the most part, my early experience was really rough. And it was rough in finding my place. Yeah. So I think that that's what you were alluding to. Well, you just, you know, when you said you really got, became aware of the musical dogma, uh, especially the dogma within jazz, mm. um, in your late teens, I just had the sense that maybe it was when you came to Juilliard that you started to feel like, oh, maybe there's an expectation that I'm supposed to be playing this way or studying this way or listening this way or I don't know. I think that dogma is a strong term, but it feels that way when you're young. Yeah. It's more about everyone has a concept. Everyone has a view. Their point of view is valid just like yours is. To say one is more valid is where it comes into play. Mm -hmm. You have this early experience of learning from a lot of really talented and great musical voices who have a strong perspective on things. And you are a young talent and your perspective isn't defined at all yet or it's in flux mm -hmm. every week you change yeah what you think about music and how you want to approach it so what ends up happening is you start to think that your point of view in its undeveloped infancy is not as valid as what maybe this guy is telling you who is great and has respect or this yeah. guy is telling you who is your instructor and you really want to listen to it because he's your instructor and i think that over time you realize that people have their own human stuff too that <laughs> they're dealing with their own baggage if you will and that kind of stuff sometimes is what the influence of mm -hmm. their 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 perspective is coming from more so than purely musical intent mm -hmm. when you're younger you're actually coming at it from this wide-eyed, mm -hmm. I want to learn music. I want to get better. Yeah. So it's tricky. Yeah. So you say that you kind of struggled at first to find your place. One thing I've noticed is that you've had like a really long-standing relationship with people like Joe Saylor and some other musicians that it seems like you found pretty soon after you moved here. How long did it take you to kind of find your your scene or your community? I'm a intuitive kind of person just like my mother i like to you know i think i take that from her i like to really feel things out even if i'm not sure yet what it is that i want to do because most of the time it's the right decision <laughs> when i follow that <laughs> and i've learned that the instinct is something that is real even though it may not be as tangible in um in the reality of trying to explain that to someone they're like what are you talking about like, no i feel it man really <laughs> there's something to it and when i first got to new york i knew that nothing on the scene excited me as much as what was in my mind even though it wasn't fully formed and i knew that to create what it is that i was thinking about i had to make it myself and i knew that i would have to be a talent scout in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and recruit people who I thought could live up to the challenge of trying to create a new thing, kind of forge their own path Within alongside that. me. Yeah. yeah. And Joe, oh man, Joe and Phil, two guys who I, I, I mean, they're kind of like brothers more than bandmates because we grew up from young, young men to 
now grown men together in New York. You know, Joe, we came to New York at the same time 10 years ago. And we've been playing together ever since just because I could see that he had something about his playing that was different. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to figure out something else, too. And that's what you have to really do, man. You got to you got to know, OK, even if I'm not sure about this, I know there's something to it. Let me explore this. Let me just step out. I don't want to just take the same path of what I see in front of me if I know none of it feels right. And was he playing like all that tambourine at that point, or was that part no. of what emerged out of the pro project? Was he became that great tambourine player that he is? Yeah. He always had an interest in New Orleans music. He always had an interest in with those drummers from Herlin Riley, Shannon Powell, and... um all of the great drummers in New Orleans of our generation and the generation before us, he would study those guys. Me being from New Orleans, I showed him a lot of different things that I grew up learning and taking from the scene as well. In the band, the sound of it had an influence, especially when I was first moving, when I first moved here from New Orleans and I was coming up to New York with this kind of sensibility of a New Orleans guy. In a lot of ways, that sound was one of the bedrocks of our music. Mm -hmm. So he's always fit in terms of not being a New Orleans drummer, but having that interest and in being around me and the band and the sound that I was creating, he just kind of fit right in. Mm -hmm. It was perfect. There's a real New Orleans conception, especially in the band as it has been, I think, in the last couple of years, and even, uh, like, I was looking online at uh, the record that you made in the subway, and there's all these comments, people saying, oh, I love that New Orleans music, I love that New Orleans music. And I, and I was thinking to myself, well, is this New Orleans music? I mean, yes and no. There's something in the format and in the conception that resonates on that level. I mean, you have a tuba, and you have, you know, there's tambourine, and there's a lot of things about it, I guess, that people relate and associate with New Orleans. But then if you listen to the actual content of the music, it's not the expected thing from New Orleans. There are pieces of it that are very traditional, and then there's other pieces of it that are kind of, to me, playing something new. So when you say, like, Joe's interested in that music, but he's not a traditionalist in that sense, it makes sense. Yeah. You know, I think people, by and large, don't really understand or conceive of music in a very nuanced way and i think the visuals of music and the visual culture that we live in informs what it is that they conclude something to be more than the actual music itself what and, they see is what they hear right what they see is what they hear they see a tuba they see a, a tambourine they see a guy from new orleans and his name is baptiste and that's New Orleans music. Mm -hmm. And they see a good time. They see a marching ensemble. And that celebratory atmosphere and that marching reminds them of Second Line or something that they would see in Mardi Gras, mm -hmm. some celebratory parade that you may see during the carnival season. I think that all of those elements are there in some degree or another. And all of those conclusions are well-founded mm -hmm. but also they couldn't be further away from the truth <laughs> and in conceiving the music i never actually thought about any of that <laughs> it was more the circumstance that led it there mm -hmm. the fact that one summer our bass player philip decided he wanted to leave take a break from music for a minute who um you know we, we we loved him and we basically made the music fit around him. And um, that was one of those things where we didn't want to get another bass player, nor could we find someone to fill his shoes because he was so great. We wanted to find another way to explore the music. And at the time, Ibanda Ruhumbika, the tuba player in the band, he was just starting at Juilliard mm -hmm. in the classical division. I asked him one time, do you play jazz? I asked him to play a show with us. And he got to the show, and even though he said he played jazz, he didn't play jazz. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a classical musician, and 
he learned how to play all of those different styles and different things that we do in the band as a part of being in the band. Mm -hmm. And Joe was learning the tambourine so that it could be mobile, but he also at the time was doing the washboard, Mm -hmm. but eventually he decided to stick with the tambourine more. And that kind of evolved into Stay Human, not necessarily thinking at any point about the parallels to New Orleans culture. The one thing that is a clear parallel, like you said, is that it's a walking ensemble. Yes. That is such a um, a fundamental identifier in the band. And when you did Colbert, you made a real effort, I think, to drive that point home. And I've seen the video of you guys out on the street and down in the subway and doing that. And there's something about walking with a band that you just don't see. And we, of course, we associate it with New Orleans, but it's a very powerful statement. And, I, and it does seem to me that that is something that you took from whether or not it was in, conscious from your early days seeing it in New Orleans. Well, that's the thing. I'd never seen a second line in New Orleans growing up. And I took the concept of moving and being mobile, not from the New Orleans tradition, but more from a creative impulse that I had from seeing concerts in New York. (laughs) I thought every concert that I saw in New York left something to be desired on the end of interactivity and on the end of audience engagement, I I started to think about what is it that would make these performances more engaging? Then I started to see other things around our touring circuit that made me realize this is just something in live music that I feel like is not really happening at a high level. It's a separation. There's an audience and there's a stage with a band performing and the artist is there and it's separated and you buy a ticket and you come. Sometimes you dance, sometimes you sit, sometimes you clap in between songs, sometimes you just hang out and drink. But there's no real engagement beyond that. Mm -hmm. Then I started to think, well, I don't like that when I go to it. (laughs) As a musician and as a live performer, I like it when... I feel like I'm a part of it, but I've never really felt that except for when I'm playing. And I think that a lot of people like that, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. The idea of being mobile came from, well, what is it that we can do to bring this element of community and this folk element to music again? Because I think it changed from the folk element when the American capitalist system came into play and we started to think about how we could commodify music and sell it so that made everything more separate more distant everyone stopped being around the campfire Mm -hmm. passing around the guitar passing the violin around in Appalachia the Africans and the drum circle Mm -hmm. or all of these different traditions of folk music that you think that was the most engaging of that was the most engaging live performance. So New Orleans is just one example of that folk element in music, that community vibration that you get when you have a guy with an instrument or a band of guys walking around with the people and they're performing and sharing this experience together. And I intuitively was moving towards that, not thinking of, New Orleans second line in particular, but more the overarching principle of engagement and live performance being more interactive. Mm -hmm. I've noticed just in listening to your records under your own name that when you made that switch and that brought in that amount of freedom, you start singing. That's when you started singing. What happened exactly that you started to sing? In the earlier years, I was very, very focused on becoming the best jazz piano player that I could possibly be. I listened to Thelonious Monk for a year, almost exclusively. And this was when I was 19. You can hear the evidence of that on the Live at the Rubin Museum. Absolutely. The trio album we did back then in 2006. And on almost every one of your instrumental records, you did at least one Monk tune. Yeah. He was um, like discovering 
a hidden treasure. <laughs> I was into the idea of percussive, angular kind of piano playing with a sound that was very charismatic, like almost uh, a cartoon character kind of a sound. That kind of charismatic, just over the top, super dense and, um, how do you say, tense harmonies mm -hmm. that release themselves into very open block sounding bell tones bling, 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 like the piano is singing and i was going towards that concept early in my development as a pianist and then i heard monk who unbeknownst to me had done this years before i was even born yeah right <laughs> and so I you were like, thinking about that same kind of playing and right. then you heard monk yeah and it it hit me so hard it hit me like a ton of bricks man it was unbelievable when i heard it and i was like this guy man okay i get it <laughs> so people weren't necessarily talking about monk when you were starting to embrace no. the piano in new orleans no people talked about monk but in the tradition of being a young student i heard what they were saying but i i didn't really understand it I had to come across it in my own way, walking down my path, and I, I, I loved, I loved it because of the moment that I found it in my life. At that time, it was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And that transition from the Live at the Rubin to the Amazing John Baptiste EP was the transition of me coming out of that early phase of focusing on the piano, and then going more into what I had been doing when I was a kid, except now I'm 20, 21, and I'm trying to explore how to make that sound come into being in my young adult life with a band and my own thing, not my cousins, but now it's, it's my thing. Yeah. And really trying to figure out how do I reconcile this impulse with this last three or four years of intense study in jazz music mm -hmm. and i'm still at juilliard studying this jazz and classical music intensely but something in me switched so it was like many wheels turned at the same time yeah what was the uh effect of studying classical music on your playing well classical musicians of the highest order understand the elements of form and the elements of melodic development more so than, I think, any other form of music. The forms that they came up with and the way that they would develop things throughout the structure. It, it, it is the epitome of, of what um, I feel like that is. They created that. Mm -hmm. And if you take that sophistication of form and development and apply it to any style of music, it raises the level of sophistication of whatever you're playing. You have guys who have done things like that in jazz, like John Lewis and the Modern Jazz Quartet. And, and all of this is applicable to jazz or any style of music. But just understanding that was the first thing that I got from studying classical music. Brahms, for instance, the way that he would develop things and, and, and bring things back in his, his orchestrations and the way that his, his music would be so potent and emotional, but still super sophisticated and have this intellectual quality. I didn't listen to somebody like Charles Ives when I was studying his life and seeing how he didn't have any recognition to almost the end of his life. Mm -hmm. And he was doing what he wanted to do, irregardless of anything that people would say about him. You know, he would have these performances of his own music that he would have to pay for. Mm -hmm. And he would have all of these people who he would get to copy his music and write it out that would try to correct it because they thought it was wrong. Just like the, the idea that you could push into music that is so dense and sophisticated. And, you know, in jazz, I learned that in a different way, of course. But classical music is kind of like, let's pull out the score. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is what it is. And you can look at it right. and it was intentional. You, it's all yeah. on the page. Right. Everything is super intentional. That... And also the technical aspects of it later. I had a great, incredible piano teacher, William Doglian, who uh, is from Brazil, 
And he was my piano instructor in, I guess you can say, the last few years of my studies at Juilliard and then going into my master's degree study there. I studied with him. At one point, I took a piano lesson every single day, hmm. seven days a week for maybe six months. I did a piano lesson every single day, basically was living at his house. And he helped me to really hook up some technical pianistic things that uh, before then I heard them and understood them when other people did them, but I didn't know how to do them myself. And um, he gave me just the tools to figure that out. There's a challenge at that point, I would imagine, to simplify Mm -hmm. and say, okay, but the fact that I can do this doesn't mean that I'm going to do this or that it's appropriate in every scenario. I imagine that it would be a challenge to kind of figure out what to get rid of and, and ignore to a certain degree while you're putting your own project together plus you gotta you going out there you're trying to work you're trying to get your stuff together you're putting yourself out there you you're building a career and i was doing that intensely i like to call it making a gig like mm-hmm. if you don't have a gig make a gig <laughs> if, you, if you don't have a place that wants to book you find some space and book it yourself put chairs up get people to come mm-hmm. you know if you don't have any music to play that uh you and you put you want to make a record write a whole ton of music, develop it, play it for people, get it right, and then record the record. Mm-hmm. I was pushing myself forward in that way. And then by that point, I'd already built this following in this career. I remember in 2008, I had really come a long way. I'd moved there to New York in 2004. In about 2008, I had really established my presence as one of the guys on the scene I was playing in. A lot of people uh, people had different bands that I would play in. I had my own band that I would play regularly around the city with. I remember appearing in the New York Times like once every week for a month in uh, 2008. And I was like, man, <laughs> I'm actually like, I'm out here. I'm here. <laughs> so that was happening. And I'm also trying to figure out who am I musically? Because now I'm, I have this attention and people are looking to see what am I going to do next. And people are saying, you're this guy. No, I thought you're this guy. Mm-hmm. You're this guy. And you're still very young. I'm, I'm at this, at this time, I'm probably 21 or 22. Yeah. And people are saying this and that. You're this, or you're the next, or you're trying to do this, right? Are you from New Orleans? I'm still trying to figure out what's true. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you mentioned that you were working in other bands, too, and I know that you worked as a sideman with a lot of really wonderful established artists. How did those experiences, how do they still continue to affect your thinking about putting together your own project and just what it means to be a a musician? I learned a ton about the business and about being a band leader Mm -hmm. from all of the different people that I played with. I had the good fortune of playing with many of the bands that, you you probably read about or heard about for a number of years at mm-hmm. a time. Roy Hargrove's band, I played with him in three of his different bands for four years straight, uh, three and a half years of playing with Roy. In four years, I played in Cassandra Wilson's band. I played with Winston Marsalis for a number of years and still have different collaborations with him in jazz at Lincoln Center. And... I played in Abby Lincoln's band for a year when I was 17, Mm. which was the beginning of that and which led to many of the other sideman things that I did over the years in the jazz world. The things that I learned, I kind of take and compile my own identity as a band leader from the different experiences, in particular from Roy, Cassandra, and Winton, who are three very different people, three very different musical personalities, and three very different band leaders. Mm -hmm. What are some of the distinctions between the way they lead a band? Cassandra Wilson is extremely free, doesn't like to give the band members any instruction about what to play, and is very, I guess you can say, drawn to creating an image and an atmosphere for the listener. So she'll say, this is like the harvest moon, or this is like running water, 
uh, we want the spirits to be evoked through this song. Many amazing things that she gives you to kind of run with. Mm -hmm. And that creates a, a very particular kind of sound with the band. And depending on who you pick and how you put them together, it's, it's a really amazing thing. Was that a challenge for you at first when she would give you that kind of instruction or that kind of direction? The band was full of people who I thought were amazing and I'd admired for a long time before. Uh, Herlin Riley was the drummer. Mm -hmm. Reginald Veal was the bassist. Marvin Sewell was the guitarist. So there were a lot of guys there with creative power. So for me, it was more trying to keep up with the level of creativity that was going on. It was fun and exploratory for me. And it was tough, but not in a way where when I played with Winton's band, for instance, it was a much different experience because he has a very specific way that he has the musicians play. He has a very specific concept mm -hmm. and is very meticulous and driven towards creating his vision of jazz, which um, has freedom within it. And it has a lot of freedom once you understand the lay of the land, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I learned a ton from that as well because figuring out how to speak in that language and how to be a part of his concept and, and build it up and have my own voice within that concept versus the freedom mm -hmm. of going to create whatever I want based upon minimal instruction. Yeah. So uh, Would Wynn give you specific records to listen to or cast to check out? Yes, definitely. He would always refer to members of the band who definitely got his 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 concept and did it in their own way mm -hmm. and he would show she would show them to me as examples of how to approach the concept but mm -hmm. not of what to play right so this is an example of somebody who is absolutely on board with what we're doing but found a way to right. stay true to themselves at the same time exactly marcus roberts being one of the pianists who yeah. really, you know, actually Marcus was somebody who I would talk to and check in with many times throughout my yeah. development. So Marcus was one of those guys. I met Dan Nimmer right before we moved out here. He's from, huh. I'm from Wisconsin and so is he. And I heard him play in Madison, Wisconsin, where I'm from. And, and six months later, he, he was out here, man. And mm -hmm. it was really interesting to see that and how he obviously was somebody who understood that concept and how to, how to integrate into that concept. Right, right, exactly. It, it's a concept, and it's amazing how formed and specific his vision is. Yeah. He knows exactly what he's trying to do and knows how it operates and can basically tell each musician what their role is within it. So from that, what did you take when you put your own band together then? One of the things that I took was... A concept is a powerful thing. The other thing that I took is who you pick yeah. determines how the music will come across. And that will also determine the level of freedom within the concept you can give them. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, I thought about what you're trying to achieve musically is very much driven by who you are and who you choose to be your counterpart on the bandstand. And what I mean by that is you have this vision of, of what you're doing, but you can't do anything by yourself. So your vision ultimately comes out and you're trying to find faithful stewards to the vision because you're playing with other people. <laughs> so as much as of, of a concept that you can come up with you put that out there and what they do with it is what they do with it so there's trust also there's an enormous amount of trust so much trust and Roy Roy Hargrove was one of those guys who taught me the the concept of trust within individuality trusting in the individuality of your bandmates because he would give zero instruction. There would be no discussion of the music, but hmm. he resonates on a certain vibration that everyone around him feels. He trusts in his individuality and trusts that 
the vibration of what he's doing will connect with the audience and the musicians. And if it doesn't, then he just has the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, man. So <laughs> I, I learned ultimately that, you know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta just <laughs> trust that you can think about it a lot, but you gotta just trust that your vibration will attract. <laughs> yeah. You will attract the right environment and it's up to you to fix things when that environment around you isn't accommodating yeah. of the art. Yeah, it's so interesting that you say that because I have heard other people say in the past as well that, you know, if they get hired for a gig and it, there's a lot of explanation that's going on, that at a certain point there's you just realize either as the person who's been hired or the person who's doing the hiring that maybe it's the wrong guy. Maybe mm -hmm. it's just the wrong mix. You know, sometimes if you have to do too much talking, maybe it's the wrong mix. And and some guys function better with a lot of talking. And if that's who you are, then that's the kind of guy that you got to go get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but it is really, it really comes down to, <laughs> you, you got to figure all of that stuff out yeah. within yourself. I mean, I saw a video of you playing with the Roy Hargrove Big Band in Spain. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that I felt watching one of the tunes that I saw was, how much of a sense of humor you allow were allowed to play with, and it's almost like you like the whole band f fell out at one point on one of these tunes. Like you, it just cuts over, and the whole band is just digging you so hard and just laughing, just having such a ball hearing you play, and you really got the sense that it was fresh. It was not you were not playing the same thing every time, and that they were listening, and that you got to be real free about and funny. And I think that's where some of the monk comes into because you know you didn't mention it with monk, but I always thought. You know, when you see videos of Monk, he doesn't look like he thought it was funny, but I think there's a lot of humor in his playing. Oh, yeah. And I hear it in your playing, too. Logic, in a lot of ways, is humorous, especially musical logic. You have this call and response, and it's what you would expect, but it's not quite how you'd expect it. The timing is right, boom, in the middle, mm -hmm. and it hits you. So... I take a lot of that from Monk and 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 of course my personality I'm I'm a very universal type of guy. I want to be understood. I want to be felt. I want the music to hit you and I want you to feel like I'm I'm right there with you. I I get it, you know. I know in your first EP when you started singing the lyrics are a little darker in some cases, but then more recently you I think have been making an effort to be positive and universal about the kinds of things that you sing about right express mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. let god lead you know mm -hmm. all this positivity that mm -hmm. the message that everything from the music to the lyrical message is going to be in the service of positivity mm -hmm. is that something that you think about when you write i think when i'm writing i feel life and i feel the energy around me and i want to capture that Right now, the energy around me is telling me to do social music. It's telling me to put forth an effort to create a sound that is universal and that will bring people into an understanding of themselves and other people through the performances, but also through education, through humanitarianism. And to find out how to do that, the narrative becomes more and more defined when I'm in the studio and when I write songs. So you could say that I'm making an effort to be positive, but it's more that I'm, I'm tapping into the vibration that I feel around me. It's more that I'm being led to that than me dictating that. Mm -hmm. You can ask why, uh, how. Uh, <laughs> that's, again, one of those things that, I'm not really the expert on that. I just know what I feel mm -hmm. and I know what has been put in me to uh to do. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's kind of how I operate. I, I really I really don't know. <laughs> yeah. I just I, I go I, I go with that. It seems to have been the best thing for me to do so far. We'll see where it takes me.
The other thing that it reminds me of is that you are a very stylish person and that your outward style is a big part of what people talk about. I mean, in a lot of the press, when they talk about you, they like to talk about how you're you know, a real sharp dresser and that you're kind of a fashion forward guy. And that's a big part of your image. Well, I'm just into a lot of stuff, man. I'm into fashion. I'm into reading about people and their life and when you read about someone in their life, you find that a lot of people express themselves in their life in a direct connection to how they express themselves through their vocation. So for me, one of those things is fashion. And that directly connects to my vocation as a musician and um, a performer, an artist, an educator, however you want to call it. Because I present to people. I present myself. I present my music, my art, my concept, my vision, my energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I present. <laughs> so when you think about that, a lot of times you, 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 are, you are seen and there's an idea of what you're going to present based upon the visuals. So I'm thinking about presentation all the time naturally fashion becomes a part of that and it kind of just has expanded from being a vocational thing to every single day i'm i live it i don't it's not like i can turn it on and off i think that's ultimately why you see that connection in a lot of people's lives you can't really turn it off when you're in something in a in a deep way you're you're deep in it you know you told me that right now you feel that you want to be making social music which is funny because you know to you that's a very clear thing but you've had to kind of explain what that means to other people i've read and seen some interviews with you where you talk about it one of the things that i kind of latched onto was the idea of changing the circumstances in which we hear music and you've brought it up a little bit as well as a matter of fact i heard you say at one point extreme circumstances i believe in making music in extreme circumstances can you talk a little bit about what that means Extreme meaning to take it from the the polished and very accommodating atmosphere of a venue where everything is set up to go and have a, a very pleasant and um, exhilarating musical experience to making it be in life, like the music is in life. We're getting it in life, like you, you're walking down the street. And, it, and it's snowing <laughs> and all of a sudden there's this experience that evolves around you and you get wrapped up in it and you have this experience with music that's in your life that you'll never forget. Mm -hmm. That's where the subway concept came from. People sitting on the subway, they unsuspecting, not trying to hear music. Maybe they're having a great day. Maybe they're having a terrible day. You might have proposed to his girl just now. You know, you might have just got an F on a test and he's like, you know, man, <laughs> going home to study or something. You know, it's yeah. in life. Life is happening. Cat bought a can of sardines. He's mm -hmm. on the train. <laughs> the next thing you know, we plan. I, I, I just love that because I think that's ultimately how what we do is going to impact people in the most positive way. Yeah. And I think that that's what music at its most pure form before the selling and the genre labeling and all of that stuff before that came into play music at its purest form was in life you started out by saying where you are today is in trying to find the high art the folk art and the commercial aspect of it and find out where do they meet and how do you bring those together so what are you thinking about doing now i look at turn of the century new orleans you have all of these elements coming together, biggest port city in the world, in America, newly formed where English and French colonization is happening. So they're bringing in all these elements. The Native Americans have all of these elements that they've brought from their culture of who knows where. Hmm. Then you have the, the, the Caribbean coming in, trading through the port. All of these influences from Haiti, Cuba, all of the Caribbean sounds, Jamaica. You have the, 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 the sound of the Irish and the Anglo-Celtic mm -hmm. tradition coming into New Orleans. You have also the, um, 
the Spanish. Yeah. Which I mean, Columbus. You know, the the Spanish influence that that is a, a big part of the New Orleans sound even today. All of this is happening. Then you have the Africans and the slavery of the African American tradition that is basically in New Orleans found its way to express this celebratory sentiment of um of of African culture of the drum circle and of the community coming together in this ritualistic communal sort of a way in places like Congo Square mm-hmm. where they would play the drums and that wasn't something that was allowed in slavery anywhere else. Yeah. So what you have is this confluence of cultures and events in the world history, this new country that this guy just found. <laughs> you know, it's like all of this stuff is happening, right? And what ends up coming to a head at the turn of the century in New Orleans in this in this great port city is the confluence of the early American capitalist system, which is the beginning of the commercial popular music sort of um, landscape that we see now. Mm-hmm. You have the high art of all of these different influences from the European music to what you consider to be the uh the american classical music of of uh jazz and all of these different things that were rooted in blues and gospel negro spirituals coming together and that's both the folk element and the high art element because the sophistication of all of those things coming together to a new form of music is jazz Mm -hmm. that's how i theorize that jazz was born it's like you have all these people coming together what are you gonna play for all of them they're different cultures, different experiences. It's never come together like hmm. this before. So jazz comes out of New Orleans because it it had the perfect environment to incubate all of these different things that had never happened in the history of the world before. Uh, what I'm hearing you say is it's not just that it was the combination of those people making the music. It was the fact that that was the audience. Right. What's going to satisfy this collection of people, right. this diverse collection of people? Diverse collection of people. And now we have this capitalist mentality that has really come into full force and developed 1900s and we have this new form of music that is taking the world by storm because they never heard anything like it and then through all of this stuff a guy like Louis Armstrong pops out and um, it makes perfect sense if you look at that historically Mm -hmm. that's the kind of environment necessary to breed a guy like a Louis Armstrong in New Orleans so I feel like That was the first time in history where you had high art, folk music, and popular culture colliding. There was no popular culture before then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The high art music was always separate from the music that was the folk music. And whenever it came together, again, there was no popular culture to make it something that you could buy and sell and market and, you know, (laughs) all of this stuff. And define. And define, like a genre or, you know. All of this all of this stuff didn't exist. So for me, social music over a hundred years later is the natural progression of what jazz is. You have this sound, this experience, and now in 2014, 2015, the world is more connected now than it's ever been. And it's connected in an even more intense way than what was happening in early America with the New Orleans kind of confluence to mm-hmm. to a certain degree, the world is now at a similar point. The connected world today is sort of like the community of New Orleans 100 right. years ago. And it's deep because the ideas are flowing at such a rapid pace yes. and there's so much accessibility and the young people are so plugged in. The technology has advanced and, and evolved to a point where it's so integrated into their lifestyle some people have grown up and not known what it's like to be without the internet sure so i'm i'm looking at that i'm a part of that bridge generation where we grew up just early enough to live when we were kids without having a cell phone all the time or without being on the computer all the time yeah and then to grow up now and it's everywhere and we're all always on it we're texting but we still have an attention span to be able to listen to music that's long form yeah like read a book or something like that Hmm. I think that it's a turning point. <laughs> right now. Right now. And what it is that 
I want to do with music is to simply pinpoint this moment in time mm -hmm. in a way that brings everybody into the same room around an experience. Every generation, every race, everybody into the same room. I just want to get everybody <laughs> into the same room. And the experience that social music brings allows everybody to come into the same room. And then from there, because it feels so good, what happens, I think, will really change the world. Because this collaboration, same kind of way that it happened in New Orleans, is going to create something that we can't conceive. Mm -hmm. People will understand each other better just by that because music is, is, is a much more congenial and empathetic way of getting people in the same room, especially if they have conflict or misunderstanding than sitting at a table and trying to argue it out or legislation or mm -hmm. government even, if I can say that. I mean, I think that an experience like the social music experience and the way that I envision it can really galvanize all of this. Is this an idea that you think could grow beyond Stay Human? I mean, the idea of social music, is this something that could grow into its own kind of universal thing that you find other social music bands and projects and practitioners all over the world? Yeah, I think that social music isn't a genre of music more than it's an approach and an evolution to what I think all of the music that people will be dealing with will kind of fall into simply because this is where we are. It's not something that I've actually constructed. It's not something that I'm taking elements of things and putting together to make happen. I feel like this is where we are. So this is just a fact. I'm basically articulating what I think everybody feels anyway. In my own way, I'm putting words to the sentiment of how I feel the, the artistic community is um, feeling. And, and if that is right or wrong, we'll see with time. <laughs> but that's kind of where I'm at. John Batiste, man, thank you so much for taking time to share your all, all of your insights with me, man. It's really been such a pleasure. Yeah, man, for sure. You're a bad cat. Oh, shucks. Ah! There he was, my friends. Baby Batiste from back in the day. Visit wbgo.org slash studios or hit me on the socials at Third Story Pod. I'll be back again in your headspace before you know it with another deep dive. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org slash studios.